Good morning. Welcome, everybody. It's so good to see you here this morning. And those of you online, actually, I can't see the camera. I'm not sure where you are. Oh, there you are. Hello. Today, we are going to um, hear some of Dr. Ken Dykwald's thoughts on what is life's third age. He will define the third age stage of life, when it begins, why it has evolved, and what opportunities and possibilities it offers us, um, especially things that our grandparents never had. Dr. Dykwald is considered to be one of North America's foremost thought leaders and original thinkers regarding the implications of living longer and the future of retirement. He's a psychologist, a gerontologist, a best-selling author. I think he's got 18 books so far. Um, Dr. Uh, I don't mean doctor, excuse me. Reverend Dwayne Looking Bill will be leading um, the discussion questions today. And I'm hoping that we can have a dialogue of back and forth going on when we do that. For those of you joining us on live stream, please open up your chat window and sign in or just click beyond it so that you can participate with questions in the chat. And we have Dwayne, uh, I'm sorry, we have Terry here who will be monitoring the chat and bringing your questions forward to the group. I'd like to introduce the Third Age Committee to you. Andy Peterson, Bonnie Carlson, who is on live stream, hi Bonnie. Dwayne Looking Bill, who is here. John Watson, also on live stream. Lucy Quaintance at the back of the room there. Susan Dre, Terry McEwen, who was helping check you in along with um, along with Lucy, sorry. Brain freeze here. We also have Todd Monson and a couple of other members who aren't, can't be with us today, Dorothy Simpson and Ken Jocelyn. And we've got staff, staff support from Rachel Shield, who is also online. Good morning, Rachel, and Reverend David Shin. Are there any questions before we begin? Then, uh, David, will you please lead us in prayer? Would you please join your hearts with mine? Let us enter this time of prayer. Now let us pray. We we'll give you thanks, O Lord, for the changing of season, for the guidance and movements of your spirit, and for the love that never ends. We ask, O Lord, that you watch over us now as we gather here, both in person as well as in safety of our own space uh, on the live stream. Watch over us in our learning this day. I'll, st I'll stir our hearts and uh, grant us compassions and hearts and to know that you are leading us every step of the way. Guide us, O Lord, in this day's conversations. May we continue to walk in your path that we indeed belong to you as we also belong to one another. And this we pray in your name, amen. You know, this notion that you're supposed to work like nuts for 40 years and then have nothing but free time, people are saying, you know, let's question that whole model. So let me throw a curveball at you right from the beginning. I know in the TV commercials and in popular discussion, it looks like the young people are supposed to be having all the fun. It's not what's happening. I got to tell you, I think the new frontier is maturity. It's longevity. It's life's third age. And it's totally uncharted. Dr. Ken Dykewald is one of America's foremost thought leaders and original thinkers regarding the financial, healthcare, and lifestyle implications of the longevity revolution. A psychologist, gerontologist, and co-founder and CEO of AgeWave, he has for over 40 years helped shape a more positive perception of aging and retirement. A best-selling author, he is here to share his vision of life's third age. 
Hi, I'm Ken Dykewall, and welcome to a look at life's third age. Let me give you a way that I'm thinking about this program. Uh, my kids are now in their 30s. When they were in high school, there was an enormous amount of attention given to helping them figure out the next little piece of their lives. Are you going to go get a job, or do you want to go to college? If you're going to go to college, you're sure you don't want to be in the military. Okay, if you're going to go to college, should it be a small school or a big school? You want to go far away, or you want to stay close to home? What are you going to study? And then we took trips to the various colleges, and there were college counselors and websites, all for a four-year period of life. Yet when it comes to life after 50 or 60 or beyond, there's no orientation program. There's no guidebook. There's no college counselors or third-age counselors. So what I'm going to try to do in this little bit of time we have together is to give you a look at what's coming and the kinds of choices that might lie in front of you. And I'm going to give you lots of examples of people who were journeying through this stage of life incredibly successfully. So fasten your seatbelts, take a deep breath, forget everything you've ever thought about the rest of your life, and allow me to share with you a little bit of what I've learned during the past 45 years as I've been studying this issue. Let me break this down into pieces. First, we are in the middle of a longevity revolution. Interestingly, during the 20th century, every time there was a breakthrough in medicine, or public health, or antibiotics, or better distribution of foods, one of the effects was that more and more people lived longer and longer and longer. And as a result of that, if you look with me at this chart of the life expectancy of the past 1,000 years, you see that during the 20th century, the average life expectancy vaulted due to those medical and health breakthroughs. And that's pretty amazing, because back in the 1850s, couples weren't saying, gee, honey, what would we like to do after retirement? Because you wouldn't be alive after retirement. There have always been older people, but very few. The living to 60 or 70 or 80 or even 100 are now commonplace. In fact, as a result of these breakthroughs, Two-thirds of all the people who have ever lived past 65 in the entire history of the world are alive today. And so the notion of what one could be after work or whether one reinvented themselves at 60 or fell in love again at 70 or 80 or trained for a triathlon at 90 were not part of the human experience. Let me give this another reference that you might find interesting. We hear a lot of talk about our Constitution. When our Constitution was drafted, the average life expectancy in America at birth was 37 years. The median age was 16. But take a look with me at this picture. What do you notice on the heads of all these folks? Wigs, white wigs. In colonial times, it was believed that the older you were, the more powerful you were the more wise you were. And so people either dyed their hair or powdered their wigs to look old. Boy, that's a switch from what we've been dealing with in, in recent decades. I also think, and initially having been trained as a psychotherapist, I also think that it's not just a matter of how many years am I going to live or how do I be healthy for those years. I think the bigger issue for many of us is who am I? Who am I after I've raised my kids? Who am I after I finished my career? Who am I after my parents have passed away? And so the idea of longevity rubs up against questions of identity. And they're not just who have I been, and therefore who am I now, but who am I hoping to become? So let me throw a curveball at you right from the beginning. The word retirement, if you look at Webster's Unabridged Dictionary, it says to disappear to go away, to withdraw. So I think it's time we retired retirement. What's emerging is what I'll call, it's not my, I didn't invent this phrase, but I'll call life's third age. Let me explain. Many philosophers, and often from the European traditions of lifelong learning, comes a view about stages of life. The belief is that the first 30 years of life, where most of us were situated during most of history, the focus was on biologic development. Also, you know, kind of learning, and learning some basic skills and crafts. And the beginnings of forming your identity. You know, who am I? What group do I relate to? 
Uh, how am I going to love? What will I make of myself? And then there's a second age of life. Here, the focus is on family formation for most. Parenting, big chunk of one's identity between 30 and 60 is taken up by concern over your kids. And also, as we all know, big portion of our lives oriented towards productive work and career development. And I would point out that up until the last few decades, most civilizations were oriented towards sort of the first 30 and then ultimately the 30 to 60th year of life. And so that's where the focus was, largely on youth or what I'll call middle essence. But there's the third age emerging as we're living longer and longer and longer. People are now talking about freedom. And what I've heard in focus groups all over the world is people are talking about freedom from and freedom to. Let me explain. So you reach your 60th birthday, and for the first time you have some freedom from maybe work. I can sleep late. I don't have to please my boss. You don't have to raise your kids. Now I know some people are child rearing still, either their kids or their, grandf or their grandchildren, but there's a lot of freedom from those sort of pressures and obligations. But people also talk about freedom too. You know what? I can train for a marathon. I can play guitar if I feel like it, and who cares if I'm any good? I can do what I want. Also, you're not at 60 or 70, just a little more wrinkled version of who you were when you were 25. There's more emotional intelligence. There's more perspective. There's more maturity. And last, I'll say that life after 60 can involve a new purpose. Who do I want to be? How do I want to be remembered? How do I want to be involved in my community? And more and more what we're seeing is that life after 60 is not just a time to step off the playing field, but a lot of people think of it as the best time to give back. We and many other organizations and institutions from AERP to Stanford have been doing studies about how folks are doing in their third age. And amazingly, most people are doing pretty well. In fact, if you look at the idea of fun, it looks like people are having the most fun in their lives after their work years are over. I know in the TV commercials and in popular discussion, it looks like the young people are supposed to be having all the fun. It's not what's happening. At the same time, there's more contentment. People become more both resilient and more content with who they are. They, they come to peace with their lives. And last, happiness soars in maturity. And so the third age, rather than being a time of loss and kind of falling off the track, as it might have been for our grandparents, today the third age is emerging as perhaps the very best period of life. One of the best ways to ensure a satisfying and fulfilling third age is to have a plan. A thoughtful plan can be a smart thing to do. There's a caveat. A lot of people think, oh, once you plan for something, it's done. You got it handled. Well, let me give you what I've learned about this over the course of the decades. Let's think of the Apollo mission as a good example. Apollo 11, this trip to the moon, was the most excessively planned adventure in human history. Three, two, one. Everything was figured out in advance. Yet when that rocket took off, 90% of the time it was off course. And so the entire trip was a trip of course corrections. And so it is with our lives. It's not a destination, our third age. Retirement is not simply, now I'm retired, I got it done. It's a journey. And there's continued need for course corrections, either because something difficult has happened or become, because there's something possible you could become. As I was preparing for this program, uh, somehow my mind spun to the 1950s. Roger Bannister, himself a medical student, was a runner. And at that time, it was believed that humans could not break a four-minute mile. It was simply not physiologically possible to go that fast. Bannister, in 1954, I believe it was, broke the four-minute mile. And all of a sudden, everybody around the world started thinking, well, maybe humans can run faster than we ever thought. In fact, 46 days later, someone else ran faster than he had. And not only that, over the coming decades, thousands of people were breaking four-minute miles. So the idea is that somebody does something that we haven't seen before, and it becomes sort of like a role model, 
and everything transforms behind that. I'll give an example from the field of aging and life's third age. A few decades ago, I was asked to provide commentary for John Glenn's decision to go up into space. And um, I knew Glenn. He was a tough guy. And I thought, wow, this is pretty amazing. A 77-year-old deciding to go up into space. And I watched his initial interviews. And a lot of the young reporters were kind of poking at him. And they were kind of like, don't you think you're a little old for this? And, and Glenn turned to these reporters and he said, hey, just because I'll be 77 doesn't mean I still don't have dreams. Well, that really got me thinking. Because I think we have come to think during our shorter lived eras that young people have hopes and dreams. And then you get to be a little bit older and you either fulfill them or you didn't. That's that. But what Glenn was suggesting is that if we're going to be living longer lives, maybe you can have new dreams, fresh dreams, better dreams, different dreams. And maybe at the age of 60, you can decide to do your best work or at the age of 80, discover your true calling or at the age of 70, become a volunteer and open a church or a synagogue or a mosque. Or frankly, at the age of 90, if you've been divorced or widowed, maybe fall in love and find the love of your life. And so what I encourage each of you to do is to just stop for a second and think, have you been dreaming of the next chapter of your life? And if not, maybe it's time to get that process started. So you can see we want to start our conversation right where he leaves us. It's almost as if he was in the room the way he has a conversational style, and that's kind of what we're looking for. I think David has a microphone that will facilitate a kind of dialogue, and Terry, be sure to um, interject anything that comes from the web. So <clears throat> I think dreaming, he also talked about hopes, and the new is a energy generating uh, place and um, have you been dreaming what, what what does that what does that uh, suggestion inspire <clears throat> anyone I haven't been dreaming um, and hadn't really thought about it much until watching the program. I used to have dreams, you know, that always, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to have horses uh, once I get married. That never happened. It's not going to happen now. But it makes you think. And I have to start dreaming. Yeah, yeah. He says stop and think for a moment. That's, that's what we're taking time to do. Um, I don't... I don't think he wants to substitute dream for reality, but he doesn't want to let go of the reality that we can start something new. We can have a new thought. Um, and uh, there actually should be lots of them. <laughs> it's, a, it's a generation of abundance. <laughs> but, um, the idea that we're at a stage where, where we have this gift of possibilities that <clears throat> That is what the third age is. <laughs> Don't be afraid to jump in here. I also, he also asked, who am I? Who am I? And I realized that uh, who I was was very much tied up with my job, what I did. You know, my contact with people was with coworkers. And uh, once I retired, I don't have any children. I have two sisters, one in Alabama, the other in North Carolina, and so I found myself feeling very alone. So, who are you? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think he, he draws in this um, idea of a, like a counselor or someone who helps you take directions in life at a certain younger age. And, you know, I think that as, as our life uh, takes place, we think, well, that, that sort of um, sets us on a trajectory. And, um, uh, you know, so we need permission to somehow make a change. 
And I think, uh, I think the message here is you can ask, what do I want to do? Who do I want to be? And the, it, it, you credit yourself with giving yourself permission because we've reached this stage. And <clears throat> anyway, uh, anyone else want to say, what, what do you want out of this? What do, you, what do you want in your third age? Who do you want to be? Moving from dreaming to actualization to, to living or living out. Anyone? We're going to just take a little bit of time for after each of these, and there's two more to come, so keep these questions in mind if you don't feel like saying anything right now. Terry, do you have any? Okay, well, let's, let's see the next clip, see where it takes us. <clears throat> is all kinds of ideas about who you are now and who you might become in the years ahead. It's another big question, which is, how do you have the most enjoyable time of it? And so who can we talk to? What books can we read? Or how do we find how to have fun again? And I'm going to make a personal comment here. So when my kids and our kids left the house, we decided we're going to try to have more fun. Because being an empty nester, you know, you kind of miss the, the action of your kids and their friends. And what I realized was I didn't remember how to have fun anymore. You know, so you go into the automatics. Well, let's have a drink or let's go to a fun comedy show or something. And yeah, that's fine. But learning how to be free again, learning how to have fun with something simple, uh, remembering how to laugh, all valuable elements of life that we ought to probably go back to school on, not necessarily a formal school, but go back to work on trying to figure out how to do once again in our later years. So we have arrived at the last chapter in this program, and in many ways, I'm going to say the most important. Um, for many years, being a spokesperson and an activist in this subject, I'd hear people talking about how to live to be 100 and how much money you're going to need to live to be 90 and where you're going to put your home and how do you redecorate. And I thought, you know, like, why? What's the purpose of living into one's third age? What's the idea of being an 80 or a 90-year-old? And honestly, I was troubled because I know the statistics. Last year, the average retiree in America watched 48 hours of television a week. So let's stop and think, not only sort of existentially and socially, but you personally. What is your purpose? What will be your purpose in life's third age? And if you're not sure about what it is, that's okay, but let's take a few moments to think about it. Many people say the new frontier is new tech. You know, what amazing app or new tech is going to arrive to make our lives better? I got to tell you, I think the new frontier is maturity. It's longevity. It's life's third age. And it's totally uncharted. I was taken a couple of years ago by the conservative writer for the New York Times, David Brooks. He gave a talk and he wrote a piece about your two resumes. And I thought, well, what does he mean by that? And he explained, we're all going to have a career resume. What was your job? How much money did you make? What kind of title did you have? Maybe even some description of your possessions. You know, you have a house and a car and blah, blah, blah. And he says, you know what? Nobody's going to care about that. But you're also going to have a eulogy resume. And that's going to be who you were as a person and how people felt about you and whether yours was a life well lived. And when I heard this, I thought, you know, the eulogy resume is the one that really matters, and we pay too little attention to that. And also what David Brooks suggested was that if you find yourself at a period of your life where you're thinking about how you're living and who you are as a person, and it seems not substantial enough or not careful enough or, frankly, not caring enough or not resilient enough, then maybe there's still time in your maturity to develop yourself in a more grand way and in a more important way, in a more contributing way, and frankly, in a more empathetic way, so that your eulogy resume becomes what you'd like it to be. So let's build on this. I had an experience about 20 years ago where I was asked by President Carter if I would work with him on a book which came to be called The Virtues of Aging. And as part of that, 
uh, my wife and I worked with the president and Mrs. Carter on a habitat build with, I guess there were 4,000 of us and we built 100 houses in five days. And I have to tell you that we showed up in Houston, Texas the first morning at 6 a.m. and it was hot. And I'm watching this president who's way older than me hammering, sawing, cutting, holding, cheering everybody on. And by the way, he didn't stop. Day after day after day, we built houses. And I have to tell you, most of the people on the builds were older people out in the blazing sun. And I would ask people, why are you here? They were here because they said they felt better when they were giving to others. A couple of years later, I had a book coming out called The Power Years. And right before it was due to launch, a Katrina, the Katrina storms began in New Orleans. It was horrible. And all press tours and all media were just canceled. So I thought, wow, uh, that book I'd worked so hard on. And my favorite chapter in that book was called Leaving a Legacy. And I thought, you know, one day I'd like to be judged by my kids for not what I said, but what I did. So I decided to call up Habitat for Humanity, having had such a positive experience a couple of years before. And I spoke to Jonathan Reckford, the director. And I said, Jonathan, I want to take all the future earnings from this book and donate them to Habitat for the rebuild of New Orleans. And he said to me, uh, thank you, Ken. It's very kind of you. And he says, you know, a lot of people your age, getting close to being in my mid-50s then, sort of middle essence, he said, a lot of people your age are going through what you're going through now. And I said, really, what do you mean? What is that? He says, you know, you've got that gnawing feeling. I thought, what gnawing feeling? And he says, you know, you're trying to make the transition from success to significance. And he was right. I think that one of the challenges, if we're going to live a long life, is how do we rise to our highest level and be our best self in our later years? In a recent age wave study, 89% of Americans feel that there should be more ways for retirees to use their talents and knowledge for the benefit of their communities and societies at large. Our personal need to make something more of ourselves than just a retired person. And our communities could sure use our wisdom, our perspective, our emotional intelligence, and our resilience. Any, any of these questions are a good, a good place to take in here. Um, you know, the, the dreams were also uh, contained our hopes, and uh, hopes feed freedom, which, you know, return, freedom returns to hopes, and um, it's a upbuilding uh, that he's describing here. Uh, what would you share? Um, talents or knowledge or wisdom. Um, one of the th themes he keeps coming back to is fun. Uh, anyone? Ken? Sure, Terry first. I, I don't think it's on, David. <clears throat> Now it's on. Ter Terry's sharing us from the... Okay. Uh, these are a couple of comments that Good. were shared um, in the chat windows. Um, one of the responders m mentioned that it's, I think it's hard to dream. The options, options seem quite vague. And another person commented that learning from others and sharing experiences is a powerful way to learn and find your way. That is why we are hoping to have a small group focused on the third age so people can share and learn together. So, so that's talking about forming from within us. Your, your being here means you're engaged in this third age ministry here at Westminster. Okay. We can focus. Ken, go, go ahead and, and identify yourself just so we all know. Uh, my name is Ken Huskins. Uh, you know, sometimes it feels like you're fighting uphill a little bit because in order to share wisdom and interact with younger generations you need to be accepted by the younger generations and some of us feel that there are instances where we're kind of put in the corner and we're not supposed to interact intergenerationally uh, 
I'm learning that that's not entirely true. Um, I've been given an opportunity on several occasions now to teach a class at a local high school and interact with the students who are considerably younger than I am. Uh, and they really welcome. I feel welcomed. I feel respected. I feel not only are they listening during the time that I'm interacting with them, but then afterwards I get emails asking follow-up questions or, or the like. So I don't think we should be inhibited by putting ourselves in a position of giving back, whether it be through teaching a high school class or any other form of service, simply because we're afraid that maybe they'll think of us as just old people that don't have anything to contribute. Thanks, Ken. And Tim? Hi, my name is, uh, my name is Tim Delmont, and uh, a, a talent that I've been trying to develop actually most of my life, but certainly now as I'm older, is to be a better conversationalist and most especially to listen better. To listen to my wife, to listen to my children, to listen to my grandchildren, to listen to my friends, to relatives, to neighbors, to people I meet here at church, to people whose ideas I don't share. And I find that, that listening's hard. And as we're getting older, there's a little less energy to draw on to listen, <laughs> to listen even better. But by listening, you often can draw out from other people what their insights are, what their concerns are, what their desires are. And the more we learn about other people, maybe the easier it is to decide, well, how can I be helpful? Within my immediate family relationships, uh, the people I care about the most, but maybe folks who are outside, outside of that close-knit circle in which I live. So I think communicating and especially listening as best as we can is an important talent all of our lives. Thank you, thank you, Tim and Ken. Well, how's it listening to um, our presenter, uh, Ken Dykdwald? Um, do you feel like you're in a surround of listening, of conversation when you listen to this guy? Or is there someone else maybe you've listened to or heard uh, address us uh, of the third age like this? Or how do you have fun? <coughs> or what, what is wisdom at, you know, in the third age? How, what do you have? Do, don't, do you see yourself as having wisdom to share? Is there anyone more coming from uh, online, Terry? Yeah. <clears throat> and then here. <clears throat> Hi. Um, John has a comment. Listening is a critical skill to connect with younger people. Great point. Great point, yeah. Yeah, here, uh, David, right here at this first table. Did, oh, no, she, did you raise your hand? Yes. I was, yeah. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> the wrong person. Well, I, uh, I'm also. Go ahead and talk right into the mic. So okay, can hear. I'm also interested in, in improving my listening. I've outlived most of my friends, so I'm, you know, I'm starting to make new friends. Yeah. But some of the people that I knew before have health issues and they are homebound. Right. So I'm calling them and I find that, you know, it's hard to listen to someone who doesn't have much to say except about their, their health. And, but they're, they like to talk and, and I, I think what I lack is the patience to listen to someone even if I'm you know, anxious to go on. Right, right. I, I think that's a true experience. Does anybody have an insight that would share or respond Thank to you. that? Where, you know, the third age, he talked about like 60 and on, and we realized that, we're, you know, we're not drawing a line of definition with our third age ministry here, um, but we do want this engagement for people who have kind of moved beyond that career stage and, and somewhat beyond the uh, family rearing stage, um, which in a way is, is, a, is a talking about ourselves, even that it's just in, absorbed in something that's so uh, 
multi-relational. But what, what about li listening? We can go forward with that. Anybody have a, an insight? You know, I, I think that's a theme that was picked up here right away during uh, our time of isolation in, um, <clears throat> and the uh, recognition of what's, ha what, what this, what's happened in the world has showed us about our world. What, but listening moved into belonging in our, in our own little journey here. Remember, this is a journey. Uh, any, anyone insights about, I, I appreciate your comment and, and, and your suggestion there. He talked about the virtues of this stage. Patience, I'm sure we, we would all could uh, acknowledge as one of the virtues of this stage. <clears throat> Dwayne, yeah. I would also like to know, how do you have fun? What do you do for fun? I've gone back to gardening, and uh, I've gone back to horseback riding sometimes. But what are other things that, uh, that you do for fun? Coming to the third age meetings is fun. <laughs> I think for fun for me is sharing what my path has been and learning, you know, how did we all get here on October 13th and the different paths that we took uh, I belong to a senior group that meets here, and you know, people say stuff like, "Well, when I lived in Uruguay, I go, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, tell me of that story." Right. And so, I get joy out of sharing my apparently dull life with people that have gotten a path that I would never experience myself. Right. Right. It is. It's fun to hear uh, stories, and uh, sharing and being friends is fun. <laughs> Um, Mary Ann has uh, contributed online that sometimes it helps to create an activity or doing something to provide things to talk about. I take one of my homebound friends out for a ride when I can. Uh, I'm uh, out for a what? A ride. A ride, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Go ahead, Sue. Sure, put on my rollerblade. <laughs> Is that fun? Marianne, I think you've got a great idea. Um, it is fun being with people, getting together. Yeah. Well, I, and I would just point out that, you know, he talks about this as being uncharted. And I think what he's getting at are this, is really the spirit of this eight, of of being the age we are, of of the stage of life that you know we are on, but is also before us, and um, all of these things that he talks about—dreams, hopes, fun—the um, and the things you've mentioned, sharing, friendship, um, you know, trying to take a new direction, whether it's new friends or or you know, a listening for others' viewpoints—is all really a spiritual, I'd say, dimension more than just an aspect of this. <clears throat> I think putting a new twist on things that we did all of our lives, learning, reading, traveling, and in my case, since I traveled a lot in my professional life, it was from airport to airport, uh, client office to return, now travel is fun. I never take a plane. I'll always take a car. I'll have an opportunity to stop in small towns along the way, um, see local things. Reading was always professional reading. Now it is fun reading, learning, experiencing life through the eyes of the author in different situations, whether it be fiction or, or non nonfiction. So, and then finally, for, for me, having been an athlete in college, um, I knew what I could do at that time, and now it's fun to watch how the advancements have taken place and to see what athletes now are capable of doing. Our speaker mentioned Roger Bannister and breaking the four-minute mile. 
of course, we know that that has progressed downward uh, considerably from there. So I, I think if you think back on the things that you did or you were obligated to do routinely and then put a different spin on it now that you have the freedom to do so, is, is, um, I find it fun and, and rewarding. Yep. Thank you. One more from uh, Tim, oh, and Tim, too. <clears throat> Thanks, Ken, for your suggestions. It reminds me that one of the things that I've either had fun with or my wife has or both of us has is taking one of our grandkids on a trip, usually a car trip. So a couple of years ago, we took one of our granddaughters to Darwin, Minnesota. Ever hear of that? I never had. It's the home of the largest twine ball maybe in the world. And we thought, this isn't going to work with our kids, our grandkids. It was fantastic. I mean, the twine ball is like 12 feet high in diameter. Or we took another granddaughter up to Grand Rapids, Minnesota, where the Judy Garland Museum is. And they also have a recreation of a lumber camp from the 1880s. Fantastic. And we, we got more from it than we thought. Um, and we got to know, our, in each case, our, one of our grandkids in a way we hadn't known that child before. And it was fun, it was fun for them, it was fun for us. And it's not a long trip, you know, it's not driving to California, it's an hour and a half or two hours or whatever. And um, for us it's been a lot of fun, we're gonna continue it. Thank you, thank you, and, and uh, Terry? <clears throat> Uh, John from the chat wanted to share that taking initiative is so important. Opportunities will not come to you, but you can find them if you try. Yeah. And, and just listening to you in this section, I'm, uh, I'm doing a self-inventory of what gifts and talents. And, you know, when you share those stories, someone mentioned that, you know, this can all sort of appear vague. Uh, what, what, what's vague starts to take shape and uh, I see gifts for self-discovery and renewal and talents and, and uh, ways to feed into that. Let's listen to the third section. There's also an intimate side of legacy and giving, and that is, what about within our families? Well, we've looked at that in our age wave research. And so we asked people, what's the most important give back in terms of legacy and end of life sharing? And here's what we learned. People said financial assets and real estate. Boy, that really mattered. You know, if you've got a little bit of money, a little bit of property, to pass it to your kids or your grandkids so that they can get a little benefit from that, that's really important. But more important than that were possessions of emotional value. And I thought, wow, that's kind of interesting. How does that work? And there had been a study at the University of Minnesota called Who Gets Grandma's Yellow Pie Plate? And it said it all. But more important even than that were instructions and wishes to be fulfilled. What we see now is that there are documents, uh, it's, um, your end of life decisions, your medical care decisions, your wills, and it's astonishing how half of the American public dies without a will. Astonishing, because it means that you're going to leave a kind of a mess for your family. And so I don't mean to get heavy handed here. But thinking about these things as part of the grace of your life, as part of your maturity in your third age, to pass it along. Let me give you an example from my personal life. Uh, my mom and dad were kind of hardworking folks and uh, lived in Newark, New Jersey, ultimately moved to Florida. Uh, before they passed away, they had been married 71 years. However, my dad became blind his last decade from macular degeneration, and it did not make him a happy guy. And our dear, sweet, beautiful mom uh, had, was decimated for 12 years by Alzheimer's disease. And so our dad, he asked my brother and I if we would come and spend the day with him in Florida and just talk about the end of his life. And we said, oh, dad, we don't want to talk about that creepy subject, blah, 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 you'll live forever, you know, the things we all say. But he said, no, I insist. And so we spent the day with our dad walking and sitting and talking. And... We went through all of his instructions and wishes about our mom, about us, about my kids, and we promised him we would handle those things, and we did. By the way, we would have done those things anyhow just because we loved our mom and our family so much. But I gotta tell you, I had a lot of respect for my dad. 
and how he handled his business and how he made it be clear to us what mattered to him and wanted the peace of mind knowing that we were going to respect that. But even more important to people in their third age, people want their values and life lessons passed on. What do you believe? What are the stories that matter to you? What are the values and the decisions that will have to be made in life that you've learned from in your own life that you want to be sure you have passed to your heirs and even those who may never even know you because there will be generations from now? There's a phrase in Africa that when an elder dies, it's like a library burning down. And so if we're going to allow the third age members of our family the 60-year-olds, the 80-year-olds, and 90-year-olds, to make sure their library has not burned down. We need to take the time to take out our recording devices or our cell phones or anything we have and allow them to tell some of the most important lessons and stories from their life. It's up to them to be willing to share them, and it's up to us to ask for it. Back when I was in my 20s, and that's like a long time ago, that was right after the dinosaurs died, my grandmother had lost her husband, our granddad, and I flew to New Jersey for a week with a reel-to-reel black and white video recorder, and I interviewed my grandmother so that I would have her stories in life. And here's a little clip from those exchanges. All right. First of all, how old are you? Well, that I wouldn't know. How come? Because when I was born, my mother passed away, and there was no record of me. What, well, do you figure you're over 60? Oh, yes. Figure you're over 70? Oh, yes. Figure you're over 80? That I don't know. Around that age, I think. I was in the orphan asylum in Elizabeth. I don't know how long I was there. I stayed there quite some time, and then when I got a little older, I, whoever took me in, I boarded with them. How old were you then? Were you very little? Oh, I was a little girl, yeah. In my bare feet, half the time we didn't have no shoes. We had no electric lights. We used to burn keros kerosene lamps, and uh, there was no bathtubs. And the, uh, the bathroom was about a block away from the house. You had to use a lantern to go out there at night. If there's a kind of message you'd like for all of us children and grandchildren to live on after, later on, 20, 50 years from now, what do, you, what do you want us to learn from you that we can continue doing? To be good, honest, respectable, and live happy with your families, like I lived happy with my husband. You're a sweetie, Clara. That's enough? For now, we got a few more things to do. Why do you think we're doing this? I don't know you, because you want to remember me. And you like me. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's right. That you love me. I do love you. And I love you, too. From the minute you were born, I loved you. And find a nice girl and get married, and I'll love you double. <laughs> My grandmother was, uh, was pretty spectacular. Um, let me share with you one other piece to this puzzle. What we need is a massive movement worldwide where elders are invited into the game. Uh, there are bridgeways and pathways created for men and women of years to give in their communities, to teach in the schools, to help the young people to be better versions of themselves going forward. If we're going to live 60, 80, 90, 100 years, the idea of our third age is not simply to be youthful longer. It's not simply to be able to work longer. It's not simply to be able to have more fun and peak experiences. It's about giving back. It's about using our maturity to be generative. It's an Eric Erickson phrase. It means sharing of your life, replanting the seeds of your life into future generations. And I worry that today there are too many people in my stage of life who are concerned for their own security and their own well-being and not devoting enough of their time and resources to making sure that younger people or even future generations have a planet and have communities 
and have a nation and have lives that are abundant and they're filled with opportunity for the pursuit of happiness. And so what I'd like to have you contemplate when you add all of this together is what are you going to do to make the most of your longevity? Where are you going to spend your longevity bonus? How will you form the greatest connections and relationships with your family of blood relatives and your family of choice? How can you make sure you've got the money to go the distance? How can you keep as healthy as you can possibly be? And that might mean exercising more and eating a little healthier than we're all doing right now. And most importantly, how can you establish a new purpose for you in these later years that in many ways will represent the best of who you are? I wish you all the best on this journey. So my, my hope is that you see the, the uh, directional circle that we're drawing here. Uh, he was talking about longevity and maturity. He's a gerontologist, <laughs> uh, and he sees that as a spiritual reality. Um, but our word for longevity in the ministry here is the third age. We've decided to make that our focus, as John was saying. <clears throat> we are prepared to um, put together small group experiences of, you know, whatever initiative taking and interest we find. But, uh, you know, here we are with these questions that are, you know, they're not test questions anymore. And I realize that many of us are really living the answers more than we're probably telling the answers or giving the answers. But does anyone want to want to respond here? making the most, forming great connections, establishing a new purpose. I know it all sounds like a, a kind of a challenge, but read those as gestures, as what you are already empowered to do with uh, dreams that are not yet, and hopes that are not yet fulfilled or re realized, that, but yet are still, still here, still yours, still ours, still what's given us as who we are. Yes. And go ahead, give us your name again. I, I'm Betty Kinsey, and I am single, and I have written my memoirs. And uh, I had a nephew in Indiana. When he received the book, he said, where did you find all this information? <laughs> about our past generation. And I said, I've had it on this paper, and that paper, and another one. And I said, if I didn't put it together, it would all be thrown away when I'm gone. And I've had a lot of comments from my family, not just the nephews and nieces, others too. Yeah. And it's been wonderful. Yeah, it is wonderful. And, you know, he talked about life lessons, and that's, that's how life lessons are, are learned by being passed on, by being cared for and valued, right? Anyone else to be remembered? Has, any, has anybody been approached by um, a generation or, or in some other way that, to be valued and be remembered, to say, I want to know? want to know what life was like for you? What did you think about what happened? Or, I don't know. Purpose, is that too, is that too large a word? <laughs> too large a, a thrust of meaning? Well, I, I hope it's giving you lots to think of. It is, it is me, and, and even though we kind of present these as big questions, they're really the questions of everyday conversation. We're going to Hopefully, I've, I, we are going to have cookies and coffee, and you know we hope that this just continues to flow. Ken, one one remark. Ken, one. I would just like to know: Is it possible to get the link to what you just presented? Is it in the public domain, or? Yes. Yes. Thank you. 
It is not in the public domain. Um, they did give us permission to share clips of it. Yeah, the video, the complete video, is available from TPT or any uh, public broadcasting station. Uh, the video alone, I believe, is $60. There is also a, a larger kit that includes a couple of his books and CDs with uh, interviews with other people. And I'm hoping to use those CDs for um, some other programs or perhaps John's uh, third age small groups. I've got those. So no, it's not on public domain. This that we are doing today will be archived on Westminster's YouTube channel. So you can go back and see some of this again. I want to thank Dwayne for uh, leading our discussion questions and I want to thank everybody for participating and and listening. Um, ne next month, our uh, guest speaker will be Reverend David Hottinger, uh, who is the Hennepin County Medical Center's chaplain, and he will be talking about grief and preparing for the holidays. And then please save the date, December 8th, for our December program where we'll have Dr. Amanda Weber talking about the background of some of our favorite carols, Christmas carols, and then we will also sing them. So I think that'll be a fun time. I would also like to know, what did you think about today's presentation? Thumbs up, terrific, great. Okay. Is there anybody who didn't enjoy it? Okay. Did you find it useful? Okay, good. Those of you out there can answer too. Um, did this inspire you to think about longevity and what, what you're gonna do with the rest of your life? If not now, maybe it will after you get time to Think about it and brew over it. Would you like to hear more of Dr. Dykewald's ideas or thoughts in a future program? Okay, all right, we'll arrange that. Um, and I guess, <clears throat> excuse me. Next we will, the Lord has blessed us with no rain outside and a little bit of sun. So next we're gonna go outside. We do have a tent uh, with refreshments set up uh, in the courtyard garden, which you may recall is out the door here, all the way over to 12th Street, don't go outside. Take a right towards the chapel, and just before you get to the chapel is the door that goes out into the courtyard garden. For everyone who is on live stream, there will be a link for a Zoom coffee hour. We hope that you will join us there. And uh, Terry and Rachel will be there. And hopefully, Terry, you can bring your tablet outside so we can get together there too. So thank you everybody for coming. I appreciate it.